I'd like to state that these opinions are my own and they do not reflect uh, any of the partners. They do not reflect a Miskwichi history series. And I think one of the key elements in reconciliation is truth, and we need spaces for truth. So this is my truth as I see it. I do not wish to offend. And I believe it is a deep responsibility for us to share these truths. One thing I want to acknowledge is all of the people who made this evening possible, all of the people who came before this, all of the generations who have been fighting for decades for moments such as these, the people whose ideas, whose sufferings, whose lives inform the topics we will be touching on. I feel that sometimes we talk about these ideas and notions of reconciliation like we just discovered them without recognizing that so many people before us have been saying the exact same thing for decades. They just didn't get these platforms. And if all the words and congratulations on my Facebook page about tonight mean anything, uh, speaking at the AGA is a huge honor and a huge platform. So before we tie tonight into our film festival, I was invited to host this evening and to showcase some of my work. Um, and I will not deny that I had very mixed feelings. I would like to preface that what I'm about to say next is not rooted in insecurity, but it isn't what I witnessed. There are so many people who know more than I do. There are so many people who have been doing this work for longer, and so many humble people who don't get these platforms, but who have dedicated their lives to this work. So initially I wanted to decline, but, if I, but I thought if all those people who came before, all those people who fought so we could have platforms such as these, I wanted to use this opportunity to throw a better, bit of recognition backwards to some of the first trailblazers who made these spaces possible, as well as throw some recognition to some of the people on the ground now who are creating beautiful new worlds. If you've had a chance to check out the previous days, one thing that sat with many of the people that watched these historical films was how much has changed. On the other side of the ledger, we learned briefly about how in the 50s, art and, the art and craft industry was one of the only available sources of income for many. If you dig deeper into this story, you hear how the Canadian government attempted to heavily influence artists to create works that were more commercially lucrative. I've been in rooms and in discussions about Indigenous art where I've heard people say, when discussing who and what kind of art should be showcased, say, well, we are not social workers. I feel the line between economy and cultural survival are too easily ignored. So when I speak to Indigenous artists here in the city, one thing still is certain. Many are financially barely holding on. A nod from a curator, a platform, a speaking engagement, a story in a newspaper, all of these things make the difference between obtaining funding for their next project or having to pick up construction jobs. For every Indigenous artist today that receives a nod, how many are stuck in the service industry, in labor and construction? How many of these artists are the next Gil Cardinal or Loretta Todd, but instead of changing the world, they're making you your latte? So who makes the decisions on Indigenous art? Who decides what is critical? Who decides, who creates the categories for contemporary, traditional, craft, visual art, digital media? Who decides what is worthy of display? Who decides what is worth funding? Who decides who gets to stand up here and who doesn't? When non-Indigenous people make these decisions on what is worthy of display, what is valuable, and what is critical, they are making decisions that in turn deeply affect Indigenous culture. We are not in a time yet where Indigenous people hold the major positions of power in the art world, particularly here in Edmonton. So I ask the gallery owners, the directors, the curators, the journalists, and the funders to be extremely careful when selecting Indigenous works that you find critical because your personal art tastes are creating and destroying worlds. So please remember that. So when you decide not to hire Indigenous people into your gallery, or when you pass up a crafter or an artisan because their work isn't relevant or critical enough, you may have passed up on one of the last artisans of that trade. Because the separation between art and craft is your distinction, your personal taste are what thrives and what fails. I will close this with this quote from Loretta Todd about the film we are about to watch. 
When the film was being made, there was a major debate about traditional and contemporary art. And I wanted to make a film where it was hard to distinguish between past and present, one flowing into the other, and all of it a part of a longer history. Hi, hi. song with you guys uh, that we wrote for uh, Missing and Murdered Women. It's still a huge um, a huge crisis that's happening now. We just got word that one of our family members had passed away in the last two weeks to violent crime and she was a woman so we thought this was important to share this song. It's called We Miss You, You Live. Um, my name is Don Marie. Um, one of my elders, she calls me Wapan. 
I'm uh, Lee Hyo and a Piti Kutsan. So I'm Cree and Metis, and uh, direct descendant from published just First Nations here in Edmonton. When I was approached to uh, to do to talk about art and the role of art in reconciliation, um, I was a little bit. Um, there was a lot of things that I wanted to say, but then I thought about it and I was like. I really took it apart and I asked myself two questions. What do I believe are the artists? Who do I believe are the artists? And what is reconciliation? So those are the two things that I'm gonna to speak towards today. Do you know if this thing is on? <laughs> okay. Um, so my role and my responsibility as an artist is that I can only speak for myself. I cannot speak for anybody else, and I don't claim to speak to anybody else, for anybody else. Um, I can only speak for myself. Um, it's not my right to speak for others. I can only tell you what I know, and I can only tell you how I see things, and let you know that there are other people out there, and there are other opinions. This is just one of many. Who are the artists? I no longer believe that the art solely exists within the confines of the well-constructed parameters of aesthetic. I think that it exists in any space where the mind, the spirit must, and the spirit must transcend in order to create new ways of seeing and believing. I have seen people fall into that space of intimate interaction with the creative spirit in so many places. Academia, politics, writing, beating, acting, dancing, singing, mathematics, philosophy, biology. You can tell if someone has access to that place by their words, their actions, and how they can disappear. It's like the world falls away. And nothing else matters except telling that story or solving that problem. It is possible for a person who's defined as an artist to simply be a technician. When you see their work, it lacks the energy that man manifests with that intimacy with spirit. It's technically perfect, but it remains silent. I've seen people working in mediums not considered the arts, and yet their work sings. Over the years, I've begun to see and understand the early signs of those who can tap into the harness that energy. And sometimes I even see it before they do. So when I speak of artists, I speak of those tapping into something else. Those who see what we don't see and struggle to bring it into fruition. My idea of artistry goes beyond construction of visual, sculptural, dance, music, etc. I believe it expands into areas of politics, math, science, spirituality, and even into areas of practicality such as construction, landscaping, and planning. It's something that is accessible to all, yet some of us are more comfortable maneuvering through it and it through us. It's most recognized and identified through Eurocentric classification, but it exists in other places. In the case of the indigenous artists in Canada, I believe that it will be us who carve trail and make paths that will show both through the pitfalls, both ways through and the pitfalls of this thing called reconciliation. It's important to pay attention to the voices wherever you find them. Wherever you find them, you will find them spending energy and time creating new ground, even if it means engaging the old, new information, which includes the history, the culture, the languages associated with this territory long before confederation, provincial boundaries, and incorporations into municipalities. So that brings me to thinking about what is reconciliation? Again, I don't claim authority over what I'm about to say. I can only tell you what I know and how I see things. And how I see it is nothing about us without us. <laughs> According to the dictionary, it can have a few meanings. Restoring friendly relations, which I would consider a personal gesture. Making one belief or view compatible with another, which I would consider a global consideration and making final accounts or consistent, which I would consider a financial. And it seems deceptively simple, yet 
it's very, or it seems deceptively simple. You apologize, acknowledge, or pay the debt. But it's not that simple because it's imbalanced. What's missing from the equation the lack of, is the lack of understanding that this country called Canada was created through a process of collaboration and treaty. These understandings have been mostly interpreted and in, introduced through one lens, and that lens has been em heavily influenced by doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, and a pseudoscience called eugenics. It's this lack of indigenous perspective, epistemology, and pedagogy that has created an imbalanced view of what reconciliation is and how it needs to roll out. I believe that we need to go back to understanding these things and acknowledge that the brokenness of the relationship is because from the outset, Canada did not consider us fully human beings. All legislation and policy concerning us still have these underlying currents. And when you look at how programs, projects, and monies are distributed, it's still through this false assumption that we are children and we need to be taken care of. There are iniquities and problems that have come with 200 years of benevolence. I'm known to say that I no longer believe in charity and I don't believe in benevolence either. They're both focused in the wrong direction. And I'm not saying that good work is not happening. But what I am saying is that the end result is dependency. Dependency on government funds, government mandate, and government administration. I've spent time trying to understand both the written text and the oral history of treaty, and neither one of them show that those who participated in the exercise intended, who participated in the exercise intended for this prolonged and dest destructive coexistence. I want to be clear. I'm not calling for the complete abandonment of the relationship, but what I am saying is anything built on the current relationship is bound to re repeat the cycle of crisis. And it's not going to be as effective as something based on the original hopes and conditions surrounding those, those original agreements. The reason why I say this is because the TRC is not the first royal commission dealing with Aboriginal issues. And it's not the first to recognize serious human rights abuses. It's not the first to make numerous recommendations. In 1907, Dr. P. Bryce made recommendations that sat on a shelf until he retired, and then he wrote a book about it. Those recommendations were not considered, and the Indian residential schools stayed in operation until the 1990s. Canada has made quite a collection of documenting and recognizing its complicity in human rights abuses against Indigenous people in its lands. It makes many recommendations, and the recommendations stay on the shelf. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was written six volumes in 1996, and it stayed on a shelf. Unfortunately, those recommendations get rediscovered and regurgitated with each new commission and report on the discovery of the next reluctant acknowledgement of its failures and its fiduciary responsibility. Ultimately, Canada has been the most negligent of foster fathers, the kind that takes the salary but starves the children. Sadly, we are no longer at the same disadvantage that we once were. We have problems, but we also have some strong, resilient, and educated people. And those people are pulling on all the secrets woven into the fabric of this country. What you now know as Indian residential schools was once our oral history. And we have more stories that are being valued, validated all the time. If there was ever a time to do this right, it's now. Over the past few years, I've had no choice but to understand what it means to mourn. Not only to mourn the loss of a human being, but also to mourn what I believe to be true my whole life. And from my experience, it's the same painful process of mourning a false belief that can be more insidious because I can convince myself that I can still be true, that it can still be true, or that I'm over it, when actually I've just bargained away my sadness, depression, and anger. Please indulge me while I elaborate. The first time 
I discussed Indian residential schools in a professional development capacity was when I, um, the first time I discussed Indian residential schools in a professional development capacity, the reaction by the attendees was denial. Despite my use of current resources, and by then where the Children Aboriginal Healing Foundation was well established in creating the timeline of events, and they had already openly acknowledged the Indian residential schools by Stephen Harper, I was naive. I was quite surprised at how reluctant they were to accept that this part of this story of this country, or that it was an intentional attempt to break family ties and cultural ties. I really didn't expect that just presenting the information would bring complaints forward about how inappropriate it was because it made the participants feel bad. So their response to learning it for the first time was to shut it down. So instead, I elaborated into the legislation that led to the use of Indian residential schools and the current resulting barriers. Then by fluke, I was allowed to present it to the first year of education students at the University of Alberta, and I did that for a couple of years. Always the result was a stunned silence and an angry denial. It would often take several encounters with the information before the person would even come to a place where they didn't automatically deny its existence. Then came the next phase, trying to figure out where to put that information or how to process it in a way that it was still consistent with what they already believed in. It was for their own good. They learned to read and write. It was a long time ago, get over it. This process of minimizing was still an exercise in alleviating their own discomfort. It still wasn't a full recognition of the extent that this one, one, one of many systemically implemented harms was harmful intergenerationally and still influencing their clients, students, etc. Most people would get to this stage and they could get no further. They did whatever they could to feel like they did something about it. They read a book, they watched a film, they cried a few tears, but not accept that it was something they were still really dealing with. And if they could keep it in the past, they could gloss over it. And once in a while, someone really got it. And I lived for those moments, watching the light go on and, wa and knowing they wouldn't be going back. So when I look at people fumbling around trying to do reconciliation, I see people in mourning. It's like the TRC was the death announcement. No one wants to believe it's true. The shock, the stunned silence, and shortly after the denial and the anger. We're beyond that now. We're in bargaining. We're currently in the most dangerous phase of mourning called bargaining. Canada has never gotten past this phase. We've dealt with it using three-year funding priorities, which force us to repeat the pattern every few years or when the next revelation of abuse occurs. We have to do something. We are mandated to do something. The funding is there. So people are out there reconciling, but they don't have the relationship. We have expert panels on reconciliation without a single Indigenous person in sight. We have columnists getting national coverage for their opinions of, on Indigenous issues without any actual relationships with any actual Indigenous people beyond being in a golf, golf tournament or you know, maybe sitting on a board. But they don't actually have relationship with Indigenous people. We have Aboriginal awareness happen happening via YouTube and Google. The thing is that none of this is new, and it's all been done before. The charity and benevolence that put us in residential schools in the first place is still directing the movement. And when I say nothing without us, about us, without us, it's out of practicality. It's not a a chance to be 
rude or crude or hating on white people. We must be partners in our healing. We must be at all the tables and allowed to speak uncomfortable truths. We must be able to apply our pedagogy, our epistemology, and our worldview. Our indigenous traditional knowledge and languages must be treated with the same respect and given the same financial support as administration. And if you want to do this right, then you will hire and maintain staff that will apply that knowledge. It's going to be uncomfortable, but it will define who is still in bargaining and who is really ready to do the hard work required to fix 200 years of systemic oppression. We got to where we're at by people making decisions about us without us. So if there's one analogy that I can leave you with to illustrate how this approach to, how to approach reconciliation, it's to realize that you have to leave that thing behind. You can remember it, but you can't actually go back. Just as you can't pick up the phone for advice and you can't go for tea with the loved one that's passed on, so too should be your approach to reconciliation. You cannot go back to tokenizing indigenous voices on boards. You won't be able to tell yourself that getting a certificate after a day of cultural sensitivity training is all your staff needs for inclusivity. The days of awareness are long gone and it's time to build relationship. And you cannot look at yourself as a savior by forcing indigenous people into non-indigenous paradigms. You can no longer consider yourself any form of authority if you lack the relationship. It won't be easy. If we want something that will last beyond the next set of funding priorities, then it's essential. I'm an artist. I don't see the world the way the rest of the world sees itself. I see patterns, I see paths, I see pitfalls, I see beauty, I see ugliness and I can't speak for anyone else. I can only tell you what I know, and I can only tell you how I see things and hope that somehow it helps. If just one person sees things a little differently, then I'm grateful. I'm just one artist seeing this thing from where I see it. I'd encourage you to find other ones to listen to. Listen to the ones that offend you, Listen to the ones who make you uncomfortable. Listen to the ones you don't like very much. But also listen to the ones who make you happy. Listen to the ones who heal your spirit. And listen to the ones who lift you up. In the end, it is the artists that will lead the way. Hi, hi. <laughs>